this is section three of your JFK and Lyndon Johnson notes. Um, so Lyndon Johnson takes over, obviously, for John Kennedy. That's where we kind of start talking about him in our class. Um, but just to back up a little, little bit, I'm just kind of give you a background on um, Lyndon Johnson. He was a teacher. Uh, he's from Texas. That's part of the reason Kennedy picked him uh, to be his running mate in 1960 was that he was from Texas. Uh, and he knew he would need some help to get some Southern votes. Uh, but he was a Democrat. Anyway, uh, he started out as a teacher, entered politics as a Texas congressman secretary, uh, then as the head of the Texas National Youth Administration. In 1937, he was elected to Congress, and over the next several decades, um, and becoming the most powerful person in D.C., he was elected to the Senate in 1948, and proved himself a master of party politics, was really good at working across the aisle. He was good at avoiding conflict. He could build political co coalitions and find ways to get compromises. And that's how he helped get the Civil Rights Bill of 1957 pushed through. And then in 1964, he's also going to get the Civil Rights Act of 1964 pushed through um, in, in John Kennedy's memory. Uh, Johnson gave... <clears throat> the country a sense of reassurance went and strength when he became the president after um, JFK's assassination. And in his first speech to Congress in 1963, he says that no um, eulogy could more eloquently honor uh, Kennedy's memory than getting that civil rights bill passed that he fought so long for. Uh, like So like I said, his memory and his strength and his consistency um, made it kind of a no-brainer that he was going to win the 1964 election because he did have to run uh, for president in 1964. That's why, remember, Kennedy was in Texas in 63. He was on the campaign trail. Um, and getting that civil rights bill passed in 64 um, was a big win for Johnson and for Kennedy, too. Uh, the act, we've already talked about it, but it demands an end to discrimination in hospitals, restaurants, theaters, um, creates the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and it creates Title VII, which we've talked about before in the last uh, chapter we went through, um, that the uh, conservatives wanted to include because they thought it would be a, a, a surefire way to make sure that the Civil Rights Act never passed because it um, said that you couldn't discriminate on the basis of sex, so that you couldn't discriminate against women, and they thought that was such a ridiculous notion that it would keep the Civil Rights Act of 64 from actually getting passed, and then remember they filibuster it for 80 days, all that to say it does get passed, Title VII is included, um, so it was a very big uh, win for Johnson. Johnson made clear in his first State of the Union address what his domestic agenda was going to be. Uh, he said he wanted to declare an unconditional war on poverty. While JFK had failed to get Congress to approve his tax bill, calling for tax cuts for the middle class, Johnson was able to maneuver it through. He also added a billion dollar war on poverty, war on poverty to that bill. Um, this is something we're gonna see kind of fall by the wayside as we get into Vietnam. Um, and when we get to that in the next few weeks, um, we'll come back to that. But anyway, his war on poverty introduced measures to train the jobless, educate the uneducated, and provide health care. Um, providing national health care has been something that the United States has been trying to do for a very long time. And there's bits and pieces of it that exist and have existed uh, six, since the 60s, which you'll recognize, and we'll see that on the next slide. Um, but the layers to getting it completely, uh, providing full coverage for, for most average citizens, um, there's a lot of hoops that have to be jumped through, and the further we get into this class, you'll, the more you'll kind of understand what we mean. But anyway, uh, the 1964 Economic Opportunity Act created the Job Corps to train young men and women between the ages of 16 and 21, so you guys... Uh, the act also created the Volunteers in Service of America, or VISTA, 
which was similar to JFK's Peace Corps, and sent American volunteers to poverty-stricken American communities in an effort to solve the country's economic, educational, and medical problems. So volunteers went and served in inner-city schools, Indian reservations, um, health clinics, and urban hospitals. Another thing that you might recognize from the Economic Opportunity Act was the creation of Head Start. Okay, health insurance. Um, in the spring of 64, Johnson outlined his vision for America, calling it the Great Society. So Kennedy's title was the New Frontier. Um, Johnson's is the Great Society. And this, was, this has been a trend of presidents naming their domestic agenda uh, going back, you know, to FDR and further. So this is not a, a new thing to be naming it, but you are going to need to know Great Society. That was Lyndon Johnson's title for his agenda. The Great Society demanded an end to poverty, so that war on poverty again, and an end to racial injustice, so that you know aligns well with the Civil Rights Movement. In the first half of 1965, Johnson passed parts of Johnson's Great Society. Um, Congress passed parts of it. Uh, his agenda amended the Social Security Act by adding the Medical Care for the Aged Program, or Medicare, which you've probably heard of, which provides basic medical hospital insurance um, to Americans in the Social Security system, so people who are 65 and older. So Medicare is people for, for elderly people, 65 and older people. Okay, Medicaid provides basic medical services to poor and disabled Americans who are not a part of the Social Security system. That's the, the kind of line between these two that you, if you can remember that, you'll be, you'll be all right. Medicare, 65 and older, in the Social Security system. Medicaid, not over 65. Poor and disabled Americans, not in the Social Security system. Um, Rachel Carson was in a video we watched last week, uh, and it went into a lot of detail about her book, Silent Spring, and the need for America to seriously look at um, the way we were treating our environment and how um, kind of laissez-faire we were being with some of our policies, and if it hadn't been for her, um, it's, it's unclear when. Some of these policies and acts, like the Clean Water Act uh, and... and uh, and the Clean Air Act later on would, would come into play. So she does get credit. Uh, as much criticism as she faced at the time deserves a lot of credit now. And then Ralph Nader's book, Unsafe at, at Any Speed, we'll see him later. He's he's a, uh, a pretty big face in, in U.S. history um, in the 60s, 70s, 80s. He's not one that goes away. You've probably heard his name before, but he attacked the automotive, automotive industry for its lack of of concern for passenger safety. So once that book comes out, the National Traffic and Motor Vehicle Safety Act established safety standards for automotive vehicles. And now that's something that's a huge selling point for any car uh, that you may buy. At least certain uh, car makers really play up their safety features. Uh, they talk about all the airbags or, or you know, stuff like that. Whereas before, that wasn't much of a selling point. Uh, once some of these laws and standards come out, um, it, uh, it is something that they make sure to advertise. The Civil Rights Movement was raising questions about America's long-standing immigration policy. The National Origins Act of 1921 and 24 which, think about how old that is, we're in the 60s now, so these are 40 years old, had established a quota system that favored Western European immigrants, uh, and this policy also played a part when we talked about in World War II. It prevented a lot of immigrants in Eastern European countries and a lot of Jewish immigrants from being able to immigrate. Yes, and it was not just us, and it was during the Great Depression, so that played a part in it as well. But the point is, our immigration policy needed to be updated. It was very outdated. And it was in 1965 with the Immigration and Nationality Act. Uh, all right, so legacy of the Great Society programs um, did not completely alter America. Some of them had to be put 
uh, like I said, on the wayside where they didn't get a chance to, to see um, how far we could have taken them or improved them during the 60s because of Vietnam. But they did have a lot of big wins. Poverty and import mortality rates declined. Medicare and Medicaid delivered health care to millions of uh, Americans. In 1960, 22% of Americans lived below the poverty line. And in 1970, uh, a little over 12%. Uh, of Americans live below the poverty line. So that's a 10% drop. Um, that's a pretty big win in 10 years. Um, but like I said, it would be interesting to see what kind of um, numbers would have happened there if Vietnam hadn't been happening at the same time. Okay. The last part of this section um, is about the Warren Court. And we see Chief Justice Earl Warren for the first time in the Brown versus Board of Education case in 1954, um, which we've already talked about that case, but that's just to give you kind of a, an idea of how long he's he's been on the court. And during the 60s, the court demonstrated its willingness to take the lead on a lot of controversial issues, social issues, religious issues, and political issues. Um, and it's nicknamed the Warren Court because Chief Justice Earl Warren is still the Chief Justice. And the Warren Court is sometimes referred to as the most liberal court in American history, uh, time will tell. So far, I would I would agree with that. In several decisions, the court upheld the one man one vote principle. So in Baker versus Carr and in Reynolds versus Sims, um, it deals with voter. Uh, uh, it deals with kind of defining the Fourteenth Amendment a little bit. We'll talk about this more, um, not in the next chapter, but the one after that. Uh, these cases you've probably heard of more, more familiar with. Uh, Matt versus Ohio, the court ruled that evidence obtained illegally violated the 14th Amendment and had to be excluded from federal and state trials. Gideon versus Wainwright, 1963, the court decided that all accused criminals had the right to a lawyer, whether or not they could afford one. So now, like I said, these are probably starting to sound um, familiar to you. In Escobedo versus Illinois, the court expanded on Gideon Wainwright by adding that every accused lawbreaker had to be offered access to a lawyer before questioning and that all evidence acquired from a subject or from a suspect uh, who had not been informed of their right to have a lawyer, that information could not be used in court. And then in Miranda versus Arizona, the court ruled that an accused criminal had to be informed of their Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights before being questioned. Okay, so your right to remain silent. This led to the rule that people placed under arrest must be read their Miranda rights before their question. So they do not have to be read to you as soon as you are arrested, in the case that you're arrested, which hopefully you never are. Um, they just have to be informed to a suspect or to an arrested person before they are um, brought into an interrogation room and questioned. So, yes, on all the cop shows, you see them doing it as soon as they arrest them. Um, but that is not a law that you have to do it right away. The Warren Court, uh, this will be the last one we go over here, addressed the separation of church and state in Engel versus Vital. The case involved whether or not public schools could require students to recite a state-sanctioned prayer. The court ruled that school prayer was a violation of the First Amendment an attempt by a governmental body to promote religion. It did not outlaw prayer in school. It outlawed schools requiring students to recite it together in unison as a requirement. Okay. Uh, AB 10 versus Schmidt or Shimp, sorry, 1963, the court ruled that Bible reading in public schools violate the First Amendment. Again, it does not outlaw an individual student reading the Bible you know, on their own terms, when they have like a, a free period or something like that, what it would outlaw would be like a teacher passing out Bibles, having the students open it to a certain uh, uh, book chapter, uh, you know, starting in this verse, everyone reciting unison or having them all read it and then talking about the religious parts of it and attempt to have a form of Sunday school, okay? Uh, so these two decisions divided religious groups 
and the American people. Some welcomed the rulings, others insisted they were hostile and a rejection of religion altogether. These two decisions did ignite controversy, and the controversy is still around today in a lot of ways. All right, that is where we're going to end section three, and that wraps up um, our notes for um, John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson. Does not mean we're done talking about these two guys at all, because we still have to go over some more stuff on the space race and some more stuff on um, on Vietnam. So we will talk about them again, but this kind of ends our discussion on their um, domestic agenda a little bit. All right, that's where we'll stop.